Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center. Monday morning, this is a, this is a good crowd for Monday morning. This is obviously a very important uh, issue, and I'm really delighted that we have a little time this morning to talk about the question of nuclear innovation and examine whether our controls on the export of civilian nuclear technology are effectively balancing and advancing our nation's economic and security interests. Um, spoiler alert, if the answer to that question was an unqualified yes, this would be a short study and an even shorter event. So we are going to uh, unpack this a little bit over the course of this next uh, speech and panel. We are really um, fortunate and delighted to have Congressman Bill Johnson, uh, who was elected in 2010 uh, to the Ohio 6th Congressional District, which covers a lot of the eastern and southeastern portions of Ohio. Um, Congressman and I were talking about the challenges a lot of his constituents are facing due to some flooding, and we really appreciate you um, being with us this morning because we know how hard you're working for the folks back home. Uh, the Congressman has a distinguished career in the Air Force. He has been a technology innovator. He's been a chief information officer of a global manufacturing company. And so I think with this background, you can understand why he has been a consistent and leading voice on the questions of how do we, in fact, advance our nation's technology interests in a way that are consistent with our security interests. He has worked with Congressman Upton to really put this issue uh, right front and center on uh, Secretary Perry's desk, which I'm sure we'll hear about a little bit. And so with that, Congressman, please uh, join us. Thank you, Jason. Well, thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you folks this morning. Um, you know, I appreciate so very much uh, the opportunity to, to give a few remarks on uh, this very, very important topic. Uh, the comprehensive report recently released by the Nuclear Innovation Alliance called Enabling Nuclear Innovation Part 810 Reform is a topic certainly worthy of discussion and debate. We've been talking about it for a while now, and, uh, and it's time to, uh, to kick it into high gear. As some of you might know, as Jason mentioned, I represent a very energy abundant region of our state, of our nation rather, uh, rural eastern and southeastern Ohio. My district sits on top of the Marcellus and Utica shale plays, which have led to a growing interest in new and exciting manufacturing opportunities like ethane cracker plants and ethane storage hubs and other such opportunities. It's um, also uh, rich in an abundance of coal, both underground and surface coal mines and coal-fired power plants. There's also hydropower along the Ohio River, and my district sits adjacent to the Department of Energy's facilities that have long been involved in advancing uh, uranium enriching technologies. The former Portsmouth gaseous diffusion plant and the American Centrifuge Project. In fact, many of my constituents are still involved in the ongoing efforts there at those facilities. It's been my work with those DOE facilities that has helped convince me of America's need to remain a global nuclear energy superpower. For years, those facilities played a key role in addressing our national security needs. And I believe it is likely that those sites will eventually play that role again. You know, we used to hear a lot about energy independence and security. Well, if you're listening to the current administration, those terms have been replaced with a new term called energy dominance. And without doubt, our domestic nuclear industry plays an important and beneficial role in advancing America's goal to become energy dominant. Because the nuclear industry is vital to both our domestic economic security and meets our national security needs. That's precisely why we must have a national discussion about the role of nuclear energy exports, as they can play a huge role in strengthening America's strategic geopolitical ties with allies and friends around the world, as well as nuclear exports can help ensure our domestic nuclear industry remains a vital component of our economy. Now, as we all know, DOE plays a critical role 
in America's civil nuclear industry's engagement in international commerce through what is known and what we're here to talk about today as the Part 810 process. The purpose of this process is to identify the potential national security implications before it's decided whether or not a domestic supplier can engage in negotiations with a potential customer or nation. However, the pace of the Part 810 process may actually be inhibiting nuclear commerce. Today, you're going to hear from a panel, and these panelists and the report they will discuss states that the process for specific Part 810 authorizations back in the 1990s took an average of about 130 days. But that, in recent years, the average processing time for certain specific applications is nearly 400 days, almost four times as long. That increased length in time is concerning, especially as countries like Russia are in a race with our domestic nuclear suppliers to convince other countries to use their nuclear technology over ours. I don't know about you folks, but I prefer countries engaging with the United States rather than Russia and Vladimir Putin to meet their peaceful nuclear energy needs. Nuclear power plants last a long time. And having that U.S. engagement throughout the life of these plants within other countries is a huge geopolitical positive. So over the past few months, I've engaged with the DOE, the Energy and Commerce Committee, as well as other members of Congress to begin a discussion on how best to implement sensible reforms to the Part 810 process. For instance, my colleague, as Jason mentioned, and my Energy Subcommittee Chairman, Fred Upton from Michigan, he and I recently led a letter to DOE discussing the agency's current efforts with implementing Part 810 reforms, along with requesting that the DOE identify any reforms that should be addressed legislatively. In other words, how can Congress help if you don't have the tools uh, to do the work that you need to do? Another example, at a recent energy hearing, it was reassuring to hear Secretary Perry acknowledge the importance of maintaining our American presence in international civilian nuclear markets. I was actually with Secretary Perry, uh, uh, and, and I won't call it an aha moment, but I will call it uh, uh, an, an awareness, an increased awareness, when it became very, very clear that uh, over the last decade, maybe a little longer, uh, America has backed away from this, and we've sort of ceded uh, the high ground in, uh, in the commercial nuclear markets to, uh, to other countries. I don't think that's good for America. Throughout these discussions and engagement, some process issues in particular seem to be repeatedly coming to light. For instance, the need to clarify the Secretary of Energy's ability to delegate Part 810 specific authorization decisions when appropriate, to me, that makes perfect sense. The Secretary has historically delegated some of these decisions, and clarifying that he or she can continue to do so would be helpful in gaining some efficiencies within this process without sacrificing our national security or safety. Additionally, addressing how the DOE processes applications relating to light water reactor or LWR technology could bring about some safe efficiency gains as well, especially when one considers that at the end of 2016, 347 gigawatts of the total 391 gigawatts of nuclear generating capacity came from LWRs. Addressing the approval process surrounding LWR technology is definitely appropriate, especially given the number of suppliers of LWR technology. The large deployment of LWR technology around the world and most significantly, its low proliferation risk. It also helps that the International Atomic Energy Agency has extensive experience safeguarding LWR types of technologies. It also seems sensible that the DOE should be able to process specific authorizations while the interagency review process is, going, is ongoing and foreign assurances are being simultaneously sought by the State Department. 
I mean, we're seeing this across the spectrum within, uh, within uh, the, the, the federal agencies, not only within the DOE, where you've got multiple tracks and duplication. And, and that's some of what this administration and we on the Energy and Commerce Committee are trying to do to, to shorten the time period, not, not sacrifice security, safety, or, or our economy, but do it the right way, do it more quickly, do it more efficiently so that we can move the ball down the road or down the field. Uh, I don't have to tell you folks. I mean, the world is coming at us today uh, at light speed. We're in the digital age. The world is moving, and, and we've got to move with it, and we've got to be able to move quickly if we want to retain our position at the head of the table. Um, like the delegation authority, uh, DOE uh, uses to carry out this practice, they, they've used that delegation authority before. We need to get back and take another look at that. From a congressional standpoint, I think these types of process issues can and should be addressed with bipartisan support. It's imperative that our civil nuclear industry remains both an important part of our domestic energy portfolio, as well as a vital tool in forging and strengthening strategic relationships with our friends and allies around the world. These types of changes in the Part 810 process can help assure we sustain this momentum, and it's precisely the reason why I'm currently working on legislation that will seek improvements to this process. Uh, uh, again, I'm honored to be with you today. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to offer some opening remarks to uh, what I think is going to be a a very invigorating and, and informative panel discussion, and uh, I'm honored to have been asked to, to speak with you this morning. Have a great day. Jason, I'll turn it back over to you.